Please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. Okay, this is the uh, much anticipated uh, single ended KT88 amplifier walkthrough or detailed description of what each of the parts and components in the amplifier does. However, before I get into that, I thought I might want to just orient you to where all the materials are going to be. So if you go to my website, which is www.blueglow.net, and it's, it's uh, I listed at the end of every one of my videos, it'll bring you to this site, and basically it's a WordPress site. Uh, but there's a tab here called Sketches and Info, and if you'll click on it and then scroll down a little bit, you will find the single-ended amplifier build um, info. And there's two sets of links, or two links here. The first is a link to all the materials, the bomb schematics, the walkthrough, tweaks, that. And the second is a link to take you back to uh, the playlist for all the videos tied to this. All right, so let's click on this link first. And what this is going to bring us up to is a Google Drive that everyone can access. Um, and there's really three things inside of this Google Drive, okay? The first and foremost, you're going to have a schematic here, and you can download this picture. And I'll come back to it in a minute. This, this is the amplifier section. Then you've got a power supply um, schematic here. But ultimately, the document we're going to be going through the most today will be this uh, spreadsheet. And I'll resize it here in just a minute. I was just wanting to kind of show you what was here. Um, so that's kind of the content. And let's dive into this walkthrough. Okay, back on this, the uh, Google Drive here. If you click on the AMP schematic, and then if you click the plus link, you'll get a full screen view like this. Or you could print it out. Honestly, you might be, if you've got a nice color printer at your house, print it out. Let me just orient you to a few things I've done here. First and foremost, everywhere there is green lettering, that is a tube pin number. And I did not show the filaments on this diagram, okay? So in other words, the plates of the 6N1P, remember there's two vacuum tubes inside of one envelope. So one of the vacuum tubes plates is pin 1, one of the vacuum tubes plate is pin 6. Same with the grid, 2 and 7, the cathode, 3 and 8 here. If you remember, the KT88 is not a dual triode. It is a single pentode. Um, so you've got pin 5 here for the grid, 3 for the plate, 4 for the screen, and 8 for the cathode here. All right, purple. All right, this is where it's going to get a little interesting for you. I have referenced back to the spreadsheet um, in several different places you'll see here in a minute with purple letters. So if you're in the, in the bomb and you see part number 8, um, you'll know it's a 39K resistor here. Or if you're in my detailed walkthrough that tells you what each component does and you see number 8, you'll know I'm talking about this 39K resistor here. So this is a reference back to the spreadsheet, okay? And then the red numbers here are just the voltages that I actually measured at around 120 volts AC input to this. Could be a little different in your scenarios, depending upon the tolerance of resistors and your choke and capacitors. You know, you, you may see instead of 442 volts here, you may see 438 volts. Doesn't mean your amplifier when you built it is wrong. All of these voltages are, I would say, are plus or minus 10% or so um, as you get something actually built. But we'll walk through this much more so here in just a little bit. And you can see here on the power supply the same thing. Purple to denote the part back to the spreadsheet. Green for the um, pin numbers. And red for voltages that I actually measured. Okay, if you'll notice we're on version 4 of the bomb at this point in time. And it's dated 12-23, today's date. Um, if you'll notice the way this bomb is laid out is you basically have your quantity of how, these, how many of these you need to order. The item number, I mean the item description here, a part number if I had one for you, um, vendor or where I got these components from, or, um, or where you might could get them from. Then here are the purple IDs that I referenced a minute ago in the, in the uh, schematic. So you might wonder, well, why is there not a number here for some of these items? Well, things like chassis. <laughs> Um, don't go into your schematic diagram. Remember, a schematic is a logical diagram. Um, I would have to draw a physical diagram to, uh, to lay out some of these things. Things like binding post, screws to hold down 
your uh, tube sockets, things like that are not going to be in your schematic. Um, but the, uh, everything that is in the schematic is in here and it is, it is numbered out. Um, another thing I will mention is down here in the bottom, I have put in some alternative options for you. Um, if you wanted some higher end banana jacks and RCA jacks like I used on this amplifier, if you wanted to get different power transformer end bells, in other words, the ones that they either sell them in raw, as it mentions here, which is basically primer, or you can actually buy them black. Um, so you could uh, order a set of black um, transformer end bells that have already been power coded. Um, and this will be something you'll see in my tweaks video, some black bolts. Um, and then lastly, I got a lot of questions about what would I use if I was in Europe for a power transformer. Well, I've got it. I've got the part number listed out here for you. Okay. Um, and then we get into basically the descriptions here of each of these items as much as I could. Um, some, some cost on items and then the total and then where I could I put some links here for you to be able to get to some items at, uh, either on eBay or where not. Alright, so lastly on this spreadsheet and probably most importantly to us today, there are four tabs down here at the bottom of this spreadsheet. Now up next you have the amp section, okay? This is where I do my walkthrough. I basically say, hey, go look up part number one in the schematic and then I kind of walk you through exactly what that part number does. And I've given you a, as good of a description as I can here without going too deep. I'm trying to keep this, the level of this, so that the average DIYer can understand it and grasp it um, without a ton of math, physics, or electrical engineering background. So feel free to post questions below. I will certainly try to answer them. Same with the power supply section, tries to give you a walkthrough of what it does. And last but not least, a section of tweaks. And I'm not going to cover that in this video, but we'll, we will use I put it all here so it's all in one spreadsheet, okay? So let's go back now to the actual diagram and let me walk you through this stuff. Okay, so if you pull up the, uh, the amp schematic and then you can reference from this, if you'll notice over here part number one, which is the RCA input, um, we'll reference back to either the bomb or if you go to the amp section tab in the spreadsheet, it'll kind of tell you what this is. It's just a standard, um, uh, industry standard interface to for RCA cables. Um, it's, it's not something that me or anybody tied with this amplifier invented. It's a pretty standard input jack. So these are a set of jacks on the front of the amplifier. Typically one um, with a red ring, one with a white ring to indicate left or right channel. Um, up next, number two, you have the audio pot here, okay? This is a, this is a special pot. It is non-linear in nature. In other words, as you turn the potentiometer from one end to the other, it doesn't sweep from one ohm to a hundred thousand ohms evenly, okay? And it does this because the ear doesn't interpret power levels of an amplifier as it gets sent through the speakers to your ears in a linear fashion. It's a non-linear what they call audio taper. So in other words, this pot is kind of tuned to the to the way your ear perceives deltas or differences in power. Okay. Um, and so what you really want here is this this uh, device starts to set the input impedance of this amplifier and typically you want to um, your input impedance of a device to be about 10 times the output impedance of the previous device and so 100k seems to be a pretty standard value here especially if you're driving this with a tube amplifier okay okay up next what you've got here is what they call the grid leak resistor and it kind of performs about three different distinct functions believe it or not the first function it does is it provides a reference to ground for the grid here, okay? Um, because you may not have an audio pod on the front end. You may would come straight out of the input here right into the grid of this uh, tube. Not every amplifier, not everyone chooses to put a uh, potentiometer or volume knob on their amplifier. So it gives a reference to ground is the first and foremost. And secondly, um, it helps to establish the bias. So because you have a reference to ground, you can then compare 
the grid here to the cathode, and that establishes kind of your bias of the tube itself. And then the third thing that this does is it, along with this audio pot here, which are kind of in parallel with each other, really establish a high input impedance for this amplifier so that it can be driven by a um, so that it can be driven by a lower um, input or output impedance device. And typically you see grid leak resistors anywhere from the 1 meg to 3 meg range would be a pretty typical value for this. Okay, up number part number four here, which is the grid stopper resistors, probably one of my favorite uh, components of a tube amp. I'm not sure why, but they're just kind of a little mysterious device. And it's probably because they don't perform the function that you would think they do. You, if you look at this, you probably think, oh, there's a resistor on the input of this tube. So you're just trying to drop down the signal before you enter, enter it into the tube. And that's not the answer at all. What this is, is it's a resistor here. But if you look at a tube and the way it's, it is uh, manufactured, Inside of it, you have these little, you have the grid, you have the plate, you have the cathode. All these are little metal um, components inside the tube. And what happens when you have two pieces of metal close to each other but not exactly touching each other? They turn into a capacitor. So you have this effect in a tube called Miller capacitance. And it's basically the capacitance between the various metal components inside the tube. And there's capacitance here between the, the grid and the cathode. And so what this ultimately forms is kind of an RC filter, um, even though you can't easily see that there's a C here in this RC filter. And what it is, is it is a, it's a high, what you would kind of call a higher frequency, low pass filter. In other words, what it does is it, allow, it allows all of the audible um, audio frequency signals, you know, two hertz or one hertz up to say 20 kilohertz to flow freely straight on through here right into the tube with no obstruction whatsoever. But it then starts to block frequencies higher than that. So RF signals, you keep it out of there. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard when your cell phone might sync sitting beside of your uh, amplifier or something, and you hear that syncing coming through your, um, your amplifier, that may be being picked up on the grids of the amplifier. So it keeps noise out, higher frequency noise, oscillations, helps cut down on oscillations in the tube. And so you want this resistor as close to the actual tube as you can get it physically. A lot of times you mount it right on to like here pin 2 or two, pin 7 right up against it and that uh, resistor and the Miller capacitor will form a low pass filter. That's the purpose of this cool uh, little device here. Okay, part number five. Simple, simple as can be. It is just the uh, dual triode uh, 6M1P or ECC85 or 6DJ8 tube whatever you're putting into this. And its purpose here is to amplify the little signal being fed in enough to drive this uh, KT88 um, amplifier. That's kind of the purpose of it. You'll typically see an amplification factor of around 30 to 33 times what you're feeding in here to what's coming out the other side here. Um, and typically you drive this with either 6.3 volt, either AC heaters or DC heaters. That's a really, um, you know, kind of subjective topic there, but um, I'm going to leave that one alone for right now. Maybe we'll talk about that one a little bit more in the tweaks. Um, but we fed ours with AC. Um, part number six here. This is a LED, and it's nothing more than a simple LED. I just happened to choose a, a really small one. Um, but this LED here is used for its attribute that establishes a voltage drop across it when in use, okay? And typical voltage drop you might see with a diode could be anywhere from one to maybe four volts or so. We chose a, a red LED that happened to drop about, um, you know, one point four to 1.5 volts in this scenario. And th so this is being used as kind of a 
common voltage source here, okay? Number six, in conjunction with what you typically see, which is a cathode load resistor here, but we're using a fairly high value here. The reason we even have this resistor here is to keep this LED operating in, with enough current flowing through it to be in its linear range. In other words, you would not want to be outside of the linear range and have this LED turning on and off as your signal went up and down. So that's the purpose of this right here. Just a little more on this whole stack right here. Number six and seven, their ultimate goal is to establish what you would call the cathode bias of this tube. In other words, you would measure the cathode with reference to the grid here. So the grid voltage would be minus 2.7 volts relative to the cathode here. And that would be considered what is the cathode bias for this tube. So really what you're just trying to do is stack up a voltage here that stays pretty consistent on the, uh, the uh, cathode of this tube. Thus, the reference between grid and cathode would be um, fairly stable and steady, and thus you would have good um, reference bias on this tube, okay? Okay, item number eight is the plate load resistor. Without it, your tube would not function properly. And if you look up the spec sheet for your tube, it'll give you a nominal value. Um, from there, you may go higher than that because you want to drop some voltage uh, between your plate, I mean, between the B plus and the plate of your tube. And that's how whoever designed this came up with the 39K. Okay, item number nine up here. Um, it's almost part of the power supply, but it was originally drawn on this schematic, so I'm going to leave it here. But what it is, is the B plus, um, if you'll notice, I measured 460 volts feeding in from the power supply. What you're doing is you're feeding a cross over here, and then you're using a resistor here to drop that voltage down some. It actually gets down to 442 volts right here, okay? And then what you're doing here is this resistor and this capacitor are just forming another filter, uh, power supply filter section that further refines the B plus coming out of the power supply so that it's even cleaner going into this small signal tube here. Coming out the other side of this, you have 442 volts. And then across this 39K resistor, we end up dropping more. Um, voltage and we end up with 229 volts here on the tube. Okay, I kind of covered items 9 and 10 together when I was talking about the uh, kind of the RC um, filter here. So onward to item number 11, one of my favorite topics, and these are coupling capacitors. And you say, may say, well, what's the purpose of a coupling capacitor? Okay, so over here sitting on the plates of this tube, right, you have 229 volts, right? And the way that your audio signal flows is it falls in through the RCA input. It goes through this audio pot here, okay? And depending on where you have the potentiometer turned, you may send some of that signal straight to ground and some of it on through to the tube. So the more, the more you send to ground, the softer your volume. You turn the pot the other way and you start to send all of it straight to the tube and none to ground and your volume goes up, okay? Signal comes in through this resistor, feeds into the grid of this tube, which is ultimately affecting the overall current flowing through your tube here, okay, from the plate to the cathode. And this grid is kind of, kind of like a little valve that, that opens and closes how much current flows through this tube. So as you vary your signal, your audio note um, varies the grid here, it makes a much bigger variance in the current flowing through this tube. So ultimately the voltage here swings up and down to mimic this signal going in. It's just amplified significantly more because you're playing with a much bigger voltage that you're varying, okay? 229 volts worth here. All right, so you've got this varying voltage then right here that's flowing across, headed this way, gonna go into this next tube. The problem is, this varying voltage is, is AC sitting on top of a DC offset, in other words, a DC component of 229 volts. If you feed 229 volts across and into the grid of this tube, this tube is going to turn cherry red 
and it's going to burn up very quickly and you will not have your lovely KT88 anymore. So we must do something to allow the AC signal to flow through here but block the DC signal. And I made some videos earlier on about how to read tube amp schematics. Um, if you remember, capacitors have a very special characteristic in that they block DC voltages and do not let them flow through them, but they let varying currents um, flow through them. So alternating currents can go through here. So what this does is it blocks the DC, doesn't let it go across to the other side of this coupling capacitor and feed into ultimately this tube, but it does allow your audio signal to flow on in here and then it gets amplified even more here by this 450 volts sitting on top of the KT88. All right, so that's the purpose of your coupling capacitors. By the way, if you're ever trying to figure out if your coupling capacitors and your amplifier are leaking or not, measure the voltage here on this side of your coupling capacitor. Put your black lead to ground. Put your red lead on your digital multimeter to one side of the coupling capacitor. Read the voltage here. you got 229 volts sitting here. Read your DC voltage on the other side of that coupling capacitor. Let's say you've got 10 volts, 50 volts, 100 volts sitting on the other side of this capacitor. You need to replace your coupling capacitors. They're old, dried out, and are leaking. Um, if on the other side you have 0 volts sitting here or something close to that, your coupling capacitors are in good shape. All right, up next, this is the most mysterious uh, <laughs> and controversial item in this entire amplifier. Item number 12, this is the feedback resistor called the shade feedback resistor. And that was written after, uh, named after um, some guy with the last name Shade that wrote some books back in the 1930s or so. And there's been a lot of amplifiers throughout the years that have used this type of feedback. Um, it can also be called an anode follower or shunt feedback. Um, but basically what happens is, okay, if you'll remember the signal coming out of this uh, KT88 tube would come out of the plate. And in most, most tube situations, not all, but most designs, you feed in the grid your signal, you take it out the plate. Okay. And what you're doing is you're taking your signal out of the plate here and you're feeding it back through this 200K resistor back to the input of your tube. In other words, it's a little bit of self-correcting going on in your circuit here by providing this feedback. Um, and the reason that they take it instead of right down here um, on this side of the 3K um, resistor and, and instead they take it on the other side of the 0.22 uh, microfarad coupling capacitor, well guess why? You don't want to put 450 volts there again on the grid of your tube. So you're basically blocking the DC component here um, as you bring this back across, okay? All right, onward to item number 13. It's the same as item number three we described earlier. This is your grid leak resistor here. Um, and we, we walked through what, those, what that did when we talked about it over here. We want a slightly um, lower in input impedance feeding into this tube here, which is ultimately made up of a voltage divider between the 3K um, resistor here and this 220 as to whether any of this signal makes it to ground. And because there's a lot more resistance right here with the 220K than there is the 3K and the input impedance of the tube, the mass majority of your signal flows right on through into the, uh, into the tube here. There again, item number 14, it's exact, look at it, it's a 3K ohm resistor, exact same uh, grid stopper resistor, it, along with the Miller capacitance in this tube, form a, another um, high-frequency low-pass filter to send some of your signal um, off to ground and um, not let RF frequencies get into your output tube. Okay, item number 15, your output tube, KT88, KT66, whatever it is. Um, it's ultimately a pentode output tube, and the pentode means that it has five elements in it, which is two elements more than the triode of the 6M1P. If you'll remember, if we're talking conventional current flow, current flows from your B plus down through the tube, um, the control grid here, otherwise known as the grid, um, as you vary a signal on it, it turns on or off the tube. 
uh, causing a much bigger swing here and what you're turning on and off the current flowing down through to get to ground through your cathode okay not a lot different here in the pentode same thing your currents flowing down through um, and then you're using the control grid which is on pin number five to as you vary the signal on it you're turning this tube on or off basically and the place in between on or off um, creates this great big swing of a signal so little swing on the input causes great big swing on the output which is ultimately called your amplification okay so this screen grid is a grid that was created to be put into the tube and it operates at a voltage near the plate but slightly lower and its job is to be closer to the control grid now we're going to start talking electron flow instead of current flow it helps propel the electrons from the cathode towards the plate here okay and because of how fast these electrons are getting accelerated because of the insertion of this screen grid at a, a fixed higher voltage almost up to the um, element the voltage of the plate um, sometimes these electrons bounce off of the plate back down towards the screen and because of that they created that was they created something here um, called the fifth plate and a pentode versus the fourth plate which was created as part of a tetrode um, and what they did was they put another grid in the tube that's then electrically tied back to um, ground in this case the cathode and when so these electrons are accelerated through the tube here very fast because of the screen grid uh, they hit the plate if they do bounce off they collect on this uh, the suppressor grid right here which ultimately get then taken back down to ground and all that takes place inside the tube if you'll notice pin number eight is connected to the suppressor grid and you don't have an additional pin connect in on the tube connecting to the suppressor grid okay item number 16 your cathode resistor here often called your cathode bias resistor its purpose is to establish a voltage, okay? Currents flowing down through this tube, right? Um, and as the currents flowing down through the tube here, um, the voltage drop across this, and it's a simple I is equal to, uh, uh, you know, I mean, V is equal to IR, right? Um, so if you know the uh, current flowing through this, you multiply it times the resistor, that's the voltage dropped across it and you establish a voltage onto the cathode here in our case about 41 volts with this tube sitting there idling okay and because we measure um, grid voltage with respect to cathode voltage this point right here is sitting up at 41 volts and this if you'll remember because we had blocked all the DC there was no DC sitting here we were sitting at zero volts uh, there's nothing inserting any voltage right here so this is at zero volts or ground so if this is at 41 volts and this is at zero volts pin 8's at 41 pin 5's at zero guess what pin 5 with reference to pin 8 is at minus 41 volts okay this is 41 volts higher than this is and that ultimately is what you call the bias of this tube pin 5 with respect to pin 8 it's minus 41 volts okay now you may wonder why do you have this capacitor here in parallel called the bi cathode bypass capacitor well its purpose is as this signal as you drive this the grid of this tube you start turning on and off the flow of electrons coming through this tube okay and as as you're turning that on and off what happens here is the, the, the voltage across this and the current flowing through this resistor is starting to vary greatly, okay? And you don't want that because then all of a sudden your bias is varying greatly. So you put this capacitor here to bypass for an AC signal. In other words, you let your AC flow down through the tube, down the cathode, down through this, and to ground, okay? Um, but DC doesn't flow through this resistor right here. So in other words, it sits right here and establishes your cathode bias at that point. So you do want to use a very high quality um, capacitor in this scenario because the varying of signal going through this capacitor ultimately, and whether it can keep up with the signal, 
ultimately affects the bias of the tube and um, this um, this overall, if you didn't have this capacitor here, and this was varying all the time, that's a form of feedback called um, cathode degeneration that takes place. And you kind of lose your bias as your music is playing all the time. In other words, your signal here is also varying your bias here, which we don't want. So allowing it to go through here, and as long as this capacitor can keep up with the AC changing um, very quickly, then we establish a constant voltage here. And so that's why you need a high quality capacitor in this place to kind of keep up with the audio signal as it's changing. So you may ask this question, why not put an LED here um, since that's a constant voltage source and establish a bias using it um, like we did over here on the 6M1P. Well, it's a really practical reason why. Um, LEDs max out at about 20 milliamps of current that they can handle through them before they pretty much turn to smoke. And we're pulling about 83 milliamps through this tube, this power tube. So the reality is power tubes draw more current than typically the LEDs can provide. Hey, maybe down the road somebody invents some... Uh, We'll have your duty LEDs that would uh, would handle this. We'll, we will see, but um, that that's the re practical reason why you don't see that. Okay, so you may ask me the question. Hey, Mark, um, I noticed here on this KT88, um, there's no plate load resistor up here, but yet you told me on the 6M1P I needed a plate load resistor to help um, set the bias on the tube and ultimately the idle current in conjunction with the 180R here flowing through it. Uh, but I don't see one over here on the KT88. You know, what gives? Well, hold, hold with me on this one and follow through, okay? So the B plus sitting here at 460 volts, right? It feeds down and it comes here through the primary winding of this transformer. So there's kind of two things going on here. One, you have the DC resistance of that coil of wire on the primary of the transformer. And there's enough DC resistance there that it actually drops the voltage from 460 volts here on the at the um, first tap that we feed into. Um, to where we come out on the other side of the full winding here at 450 volts. So you've got some DC voltage drop as a result of that. You also have what is called the impedance of this transformer, and that is not equivalent to the DC resistance. In other words, if you hook an ohm meter up here on both sides of this transformer, you don't get 5,000 ohms here. That 5,000 ohms is what is seen um, from a AC standpoint, in other words, it's an impedance, not a resistance, okay? And this 5,000 ohms would be what, it would also be seen as part of your plate load resistor here um, from an AC signal standpoint. So you do kind of have a plate load resistor, it just happens to be the primary of your output transformer here, okay? All right, back over to item number 18 here. It's kind of hard to talk about item number 18 without talking about 19 and 20 all in conjunction with each other and honestly a little bit of 21 here. So let's just talk about this switch and the function it performs. Okay, the way that this tube was designed to be ran, okay, was in pentode mode and the way a pentode typically works in, a, in an amplifier like this is remember you will want to feed um, the screen grid here with a voltage, a constant voltage, slightly lower than the plate. Remember, you're trying to help accelerate uh, these electrons flowing through here, so you create a higher potential here. Um, and then they actually fly by that grid and because of the even higher potential here on the plate and uh, make it to the plate and go through, okay? So typically you do something um, to drop the voltage a little bit um, on your screen compared to the plate. And there's kind of two things going on here causing that, okay? First and foremost, you have um, a higher voltage sitting on this 43% ultralinear tap than you do at the very top where you're feeding your B+. So if you connected your screen grid here, 
directly over here in pentode mode to the ultralinear 43% tap of your transformer, you would actually have a higher voltage on your screen grid than you do your plate, which would be a bad thing, right? Um, because then you would basically turn your screen into your plate because the electrons would never fly by it to get to a higher potential. There would actually be a lower potential sitting on the other side of it. So we've got to drop the voltage down some as we get to our screen here um, from this 455 volts down to something less than 450 volts. And that is the purpose of R20 right here, okay? Or our item 20 here. It's, uh, it's a 1.2K resistor. Um, and it's really designed to help drop this voltage down so that the screen sits at a lower level um, than the plate. Okay? And that's just the way this tube functions, was designed to function in pentode mode. Well, what this switch does is it allows you to switch from this 1.2K, but which by the way, it would also feed through this 100 ohm, so you'd actually have 1.3K um, here causing some voltage drop, right? Um, but if you want to use this in what they call triode mode, typically what you do is you have a switch that basically straps the screen grid here at the same potential as your plate. So in other words, you basically tie the screen to the plate, which is what the switch is doing here. It's taking the screen here straight up and tying it to the plate. And for, for all intents and purposes, making it the same voltage level uh, potential as the plate. Now, however, there's this little 100 ohm resistor here. And you say, well, what is that for? And that gets used sometimes in tubes um, as a kind of a, almost like a grid stopper resistor. It's kind of a screen stopper resistor. This little low value 100 ohm resistor its purpose is not to limit the current to the grid. It's not to drop the voltage even further. Its purpose is really to suppress parasitic oscillations and keep this tube from possibly running away with, with uh, uh, an oscillation at a frequency you may not even be able to hear. Um, so your tube could be sitting there oscillating and you're, you wouldn't even know it. Um, and these uh, putting a 100 ohm resistor here is kind of... Not, ex not extremely common, but I see it from time to time, and it's used to help uh, stop that oscillation. So, real quick again, okay, if we're going to run in ultralinear mode, got to drop the voltage down some because we're sitting at 450 some volts. This 1.3 will drop the um, value, the voltage potential down enough to get your screen grid lower than your plate. Okay, when you switch over here to triode mode. You're in essence connecting the screen to the triode here, I mean to the plate, and basically have um, the similar potential here. Very little current flowing through the screen here. Uh, most of it flows straight through the, through the tube. Hope that makes sense. If not, post below and I'll try to explain it a little better. That, that was my best stab at it. All right, so on to item number 21. This is a very magical item. It's amazing how much a actual output transformer really does for the circuit. It was play, I've already showed you a couple roles it's played. It provided a screen tap um, to, to provide um, a form of feedback um, from the circuit back into the screen grid here, right? Um, I've already told you it played a DC purpose here of uh, dropping the voltage some. I've already told you it plays an AC um, um, role here in setting the primary impedance or load back to this output tube. Tubes here like to see a high impedance load to them. They don't do very well driving low impedance um, loads. And if you think about your average speaker in your house, 4 ohms, 8 ohms, 16 ohms, those are extremely low impedance devices, right? And so you couldn't really just hook your speakers up directly to the outputs of this tube because it would have a hard time driving a 4, 8, or 16 ohm loads. So one of the things that this transformer does from an impedance standpoint is it, it transforms um, the load. Um, so your 8 ohm load at your speaker is being transformed into a 5K load 
that your output tube sees. Okay, so you've got impedance transformation taking place, and, and that's a result of the um, windings ratio between the primary and secondary. But it also plays, at the same time it's doing that, it also plays a voltage transformation role. So if you think about it, um, here on the output of your KT88, you could have a voltage swing with an AC signal, an audio signal, feeding into it of up to 450 volts on the output. In other words, it could swing all the way down to zero volts, all the way up to 450 volts. And imagine, connect without a transformer here, imagine connecting, even if you had some speakers that were uh, 5,000 ohm load speakers, imagine hooking up speaker wires to the plate of this tube and then running them across the room and hooking them up to your 5,000 ohm speakers. Well, if you accidentally touched your speaker wires while this was playing, um, you, you may light up like a Christmas tree with 450 volts. So what happens here is just like the impedance transformation takes place in one direction, 5K to 8 ohms, you also have a voltage transformation based upon the same turns ratio. So you might end up with 20 or 30 volts, 40 volts of swing on this side um, or less. Um, in other words, it transforms this from being a voltage source into a current source. So your speakers care more about current to drive them than they do voltage. And so that's all these transformations kind of take place in this transformer. So you end up with the right impedance. You end up with, instead of driving with a high voltage, you're driving with a higher current and a lower voltage, and um, all of this takes place in the magic of this transformer. So um, that's why this, they are such critical, critical devices and the quality of them. You know, I get the question a lot um, from people, hey, you know, what's so special about transformers? It's just some wire on one side with a number of windings, some wire on the other side with a number of windings. Well, there is a lot more to it than that. The quality of the core material material here, and and when it when it saturates or not um, is very important. The, the the spacing between these wirings, the size of these wires, um, all this plays a role in kind of how efficient or effective your output transformer is here. So, all right, we're going to roll on out of the tube amplifier now at this point and going to jump over to the power supply. Okay, part number 22 here in the power supply. And keep in mind, the whole purpose of the power supply is just to provide the right voltages at the right places in your amplifier. Um, part number 22 is just a standard IEC connector. The beauty of it, you can have a cord on the other side of it for a standard US outlet or a standard European outlet or a standard Australian outlet. Um, so that's the beauty of this uh, standardized IEC connector here. Item number 23 here is really your fuse holder and a 2 amp fuse. I typically use a slow blow fuse in tube amplifiers. Uh, mainly because the turning on of the amp um, typically causes a fairly large inrush of current um, and uh, slow blow fuse less likely to blow just in the act of turning your amplifier on. Up next you have a single post single throw switch. In other words, you're just switching um, power here to the hot lead of your um, primary on your transformer. Of course, when you open this up, um, then you basically, uh, you know, break the circuit, so you're feeding no, nothing to the uh, primary of the transformer, thus feeding nothing to the amplifier. You flip the switch, in other words, turn it on, close the connection, and you complete the circuit here. Okay, that's the purpose of number 24. Number 25, this is your power transformer, and it, what it does here is it, it transforms voltages basically. So you've got 120 volts for the US here on the primary and on the secondary you want a different set of voltages. So and there happens to be three separate windings in this transformer. 
uh, that perform three different functions within this amplifier, okay? The first one is you have a winding here that provides 6.3 volts of AC. And then you take that 6.3 volts of AC and you feed it throughout the amplifier to the various um, filaments where you would feed the tubes uh, to heat them up, okay? And a lot of times, you'll notice here it just has a symbol that says, hey, this is going to the tube filaments. And if you remember back over in the amplifier drawing, I had mentioned that it would not show the filaments being drawn. In other words, you just need to look up in a diagram um, which pins are for the filaments and know that they be they're fed via the 6.3 volts. And if you had if you happen to have an amp that maybe had um, a tube in it that wasn't at 6.3 volts, you may need a different winding to feed the filaments of that tube. And that is the case up here. Um, this 5AR4 or the 5U4 or 5V4, whatever tube you put into this as your rectifier tube, it needs 5 volts AC to drive it and not 6.3 volts AC to drive it. So there's a separate winding here um, for 5 volts. And so the AC from this comes down here, feeds into pins 2 and 8 and lights up, um, you know, heats up this tube and... Um, ultimately causes it to function properly, okay? And then you have a winding here that happens to be your high voltage winding. And if you'll notice over here, you can pick a couple different models. I picked one here that actually is 380 volts. Then it says zero, then 380 volts. And you might wonder, well, what is that? Well, that means that one side of this transformer, this point right here in the middle, is at zero. In other words, it's a center tap and it's tied to ground right here. The other side of this, you can have 380 volts swing on one side and 380 volts swing on the other side, which then gets fed into this tube, which is nothing more than two diodes inside of a single glass envelope. What is a little unique about this, a little different than maybe a diode, is that the output of your rectifier here, the plate, um, excuse me, the cathodes, um, they're also um, shared with the heater here, okay? So, so you kind of have this 5 volts AC here on this wire um, going through the filaments. You also have picking up off of the other side of this tube right here, as, the, as this half conducts, this diode is working. And as this half of the AC signal conducts, this diode is working. And what you end up pulling off up here is 474 volts of DC. So at this point on the wire where my cursor is pointed to, you have two things at that point. 474 volts of DC, rectified DC, along with five volts of AC at that same point on the wire there, okay? Kind of got to get your head around at a single point on the wire, you can have both AC and DC. But this 474 volts right here, it's not very pure. It is a rectified DC signal. And so it's got some ripple to it at this point. And then that becomes the purpose of item number 27 here. This 10 microfarad, 630 volt um, poly cap. Um, and we could have used an electrolytic here. We just chose to use a poly cap. Um, what happens is, is it's it along, along with this inductor here, along with this capacitor, second capacitor, form a CRC filter circuit, which is a, an extremely effective way of filtering out any ripple on that DC voltage and ultimately turns it into a solid, stable voltage over here to feed the rest of your amplifier, okay? Um, and I made a whole entire video on the purpose of what a reactor does uh, or a choke. I would recommend going and watching that video. Um, and, I, and I talk about the purpose of this whole CRC circuit in that video. Um, but if you'll notice, you got 474 volts sitting right here on top of this 10 microfarad capacitor. Um, one of the things you have to pay special attention to is if you look up the spec sheet for a rectifier tube, it will specify 
the amount of capacitance that it can deal with in the first stage of a CRC um, filter following it. And it's typically around 30 microfarads. So typically this first stage here, you'll see anything from 10 to about 30 microfarads. Unlike if you used a solid state diode here, it doesn't have that same characteristic. And it it would allow you to put maybe a 100 microfarad capacitor here, an inductor, and another 100 microfarad capacitor on the other side. Um, so kind of feeding through, got your second filter here. In our case, we're using an F&T um, 100 microfarad plus 100 microfarad, 200 microfarads in one capacitor. When you parallel those and put two capacitors in parallel, they add together, and that's what we did in this amplifier. So we actually ended up with 200 microfarads of capacitance on the other side of this inductor. And by the way, this tube doesn't care about um, the capacitance on the other side of the inductor here, just the first one. Um, but then we've dropped down to 460 volts here on the other side of the B+. Some people gave me a little bit of grief saying, hey, why are you using a 500 volt capacitor here when you have, we're up here close to 500 volts? Well, there's enough room here between the 460 volts and the 500 volts. I feel to be safe here in this scenario. And then ultimately th from there, you're feeding out and um, feeding the uh, the beep, you know the voltage on your amplifier. We do use, if you remember, that 4.7K and the other capacitor to drop it down a little more before we feed the plate of the 6N1P. But it's a fairly simplistic uh, um, power supply here to feed this unit. Hope that makes sense. All right, sorry about the 50 minute long video, but I felt like I needed to walk through each component one by one. What I did not get into was the design of this amplifier. That's what wasn't what this was about. Um, and I didn't design this amplifier. Um, but you know, what I thought I might do, if people have more specific questions than the level of depth I've gone through, I might start capturing those questions that you put down below. And after the tweaks video, I told you maybe a month later I would come back after uh, playing with this amplifier even a little more, and um, I might make a uh, another update video or something. Maybe I'll just address all those questions at that point to the best of my ability um, at that point. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned. Next will be the tweaks video, and I think that will wrap this series up.